Thanks, everybody, for tuning into Border City Rock Talk, where you get uh, some great news rock-wise and some great interviews and uh, from great interviewees with a comedic touch. Um, today, I have uh, one of uh, uh, the 80s, especially uh, guitar legends uh, in uh, Great White. Everybody knows Mark Kendall. Um, uh, Mark, does anybody ever um, ask you if you're married to Barbie? If it's Ken Dahl, or is it Kendall? Uh, nobody's asked that yet, but uh, that's a fair question. <laughs> I guess you could kind of consider a Barbie. Consider her a Barbie. She's pretty. Oh awesome. well, there you go. Well, you got some brownie points there. Right on. <laughs> How are you doing, man? Uh, doing good, man. That's awesome. So, um, yeah. just going to ask you some quick things, and then we'll talk about the uh, the subject that we'd like to talk about. Um, you've got some tour dates coming up with um, Great White um, in the summer, and you're doing uh, a bunch of shows. And I see, I've looked in, uh, on the um, the list, and a bunch of them, um, Slafter is opening up for you, correct? Slafter? Slafter, yeah. Oh, oh you mean Slaughter? Um, you, is that I, the way? So I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't correct you, but Mark Slaughter's a, a kind of a friend of mine. Oh, so. I, I consider yeah. myself well read, right, so it's Slaughter. Slaughter, yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right, and then and then you've got a show with Vince Neil. I saw, so you've been in touch with um, Vince, and so I guess he's recovering well. That's great news, correct? Yeah, I've known Vince since he was about fifteen, so you know we got some history and. Wow. Which I played one? at his high school one time at, at lunchtime before he was even in a band. <laughs> Some friends of mine go, hey, that, guy, that guy's a singer. And he was standing like four feet from me, literally like four feet in front of me. There was no stage. We were playing in a hallway. And he goes, that guy's a singer. And I go, really? I go, what band is he in? And he go, uh, he's not in a band. He just likes to sing. <laughs> He just walks down the hallway and sings. He just sings all the time. But he, he did end up being in a band uh, called Rock Candy a couple of years later, and we did do a battle of the bands with them. Who won? At the, at the, it's like Teen Center. It was actually the band that won. I can't remember the name of them, but they had a black singer that sang Tie Your Mother Down like absolutely spot on. Oh. So they won. Vince came in third. Uh, his band came in third, and my band came in fourth. Wow! I mean, it's 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 interesting <laughs> when you look at things like that. How a certain area, uh, demographic-wise, a lot of talent would come out of. Like a lot of you guys, um, you know, came out from the uh, whiskey go-go days and the Trobador or whatever, Trobador, Trobador. Yeah. Um, and but a lot of you went to school together, and like so, California is a big, uh, big state, so. You guys would party at the same bars. You'd party at the same parties, and like you're saying, you yeah. you're the same high school. Yeah, the, uh, the the music scene in general around the LA area in the late '70s and early '80s was a pretty healthy music scene. There was just a ton of bands, and when we weren't playing in clubs, we were playing in backyards. Yeah. And in fact, the first time I saw Van Halen was in a junkyard. It was about three blocks from my house, and my buddy and me w walked up and saw them for the first time. That was pretty cool. Wow, that would be amazing. Um, well, and speaking with Van Halen, look at how things, you know, things, you know, come together in full circle with Mitch and the band. Obviously, he was asked to sing for Van Halen, and yeah, I. I didn't know much about that story until I saw that short documentary because it was never mentioned but i i did hear that they accepted him in the band and then there was some confusion about uh david lee roth being in the band because they were on some award show and mitch didn't like that confusion so he kind of went off and stuck with his solo career or whatever well he's in good company now obviously and one more thing uh touching on the van halen thing uh canadian singer sass jordan i'm sure you're aware she was asked, well, they, they were almost, she was almost in Van Halen. I'd interviewed her. They'd asked her to go over and hang out with Eddie and, um, and Alex will confirm this. And um, just, she said, basically, I was their bum boy. They weren't supposed to drink at the time. So I'd be going out and getting their beer. And then she said that they kept asking her to come back, uh, you know, to listen and, you know, sing with them. 
And then she said to her manager, says, um, are they thinking of asking me to join the band? And at the time, this is Sass Jordan. She wouldn't be bullshitting. She said that the yeah. her manager said that they were considering that. Oh, wow, that's heavy. I had a, actually had a chick singer at one time. Uh, at our very beginnings, we had a girl singer for about six months. And then George Lynch from Dawkins stole yeah. her out of my band. And uh, so then I got a guy singing that sounded like Rob Halford, like exactly. <laughs> I mean, wow. it was kind of funny. But uh, actually had a girl singer. She had a pretty rough voice, man. But nice, uh, nice sound to her voice and a pretty good range. There's so many females going into the hard rock scene right now. It's amazing. Like, I mean, just recently, uh, well, sort of recently, Tanya o o Callaghan with uh, mm. Boy Snake, right? Yeah. Just, it's just amazing how. So that's great. Anyways, um, before we get on to the topic of um, alcoholism and um, in the industry, <laughs> you've been sober for all these years and you're an inspiration to, to many. Um I got to tell you, my favorite Great White album has to be Can't Get There From Here. It really does. I mean, just just the ballads that you guys wrote are slower songs like Hey Mister and, um, you know, those just amazing. But um, one of my favorite songs is Face the Day. Oh, yeah. I'd like to hear that one. Well, uh, I'll tell you what, just happen to have, um, you hear that? No. Oh, it, it no, would, it, no sound. There's no sound. It would have. It would if it, would've, it, would've, it, I, it used to be a lot louder. It, it would be. You would hear it if I were playing it, which I will play later. Oh, yeah. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. yeah, that's pretty funny, man. Uh, <laughs> all right. Okay, so let's talk about. Um, you've been sober for how many years, uh, Mark? Okay. Past thirteen in November. Congrats, man. I'm telling you, um, it is a serious issue and disease, and what horrors did you witness on the road that led you to that final, you know, what you've had enough, your body's coming close to this and that, and around you, like, I mean, you know, Janie Lane, you know, Amy Whitehouse, just, you've seen a lot more than, than I know of, but give me a, just a, and the viewers, uh, four of them, all four of them, <laughs> um, just a basic rundown of um, what's caused you to stop and the horrors you've seen. Yeah, um, well, as far as on the road, it just, er, everything, when, when you start partying too much and you're doing all this traveling and you're playing five nights a week, it, it starts to wear you down a little bit and, you know, everything just seems to become difficult. Um, I kind of got away with it in my 20s, but when I was about 34, I believe, I was really getting a lot of pain. I was waking up kind of shaky, you know, I was rolling out of bed, just grabbing a beer, you know, mm -hmm. so I kind of felt like my band was going to intervene on me. I really, the tension was in the air and I could feel it. Mm -hmm. So uh, we were going to have this meeting, and before they even said anything, I just said, hey, you guys, you know, I want to quit, but I've never done it before. I don't know how it's done, you know, And uh, but I'm, I'm willing to give it a shot. So I went into a rehab in Arizona, was there for 30 days, came straight out right to a, a, a record release party of us in the oh. Capitol parking lot, wow. and um, I... It was very nerve-wracking, uh, you know, I never really totally played sober, even when I was a teenager, you know, to have a couple beers, yeah. it, it was all, to loosen up or whatever. So I'd never played sober, and I was nervous anyways, you know, 30 days doesn't sound like a lot, but when you're isolated, and then you go out in the world, it, it's a little weird at first, you, know, you kind of ease your way in, well, especially dead sober, you know. Yeah. Didn't mean to cut you off, but speaking of isolation, uh, I live in Canada, so we're used to that with all their lockdowns. So, yeah, we know what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so anyways, um, you know, that was my first attempt, and I went about 10 months, and then I had slips. And basically what I did was for the next 15 years or so, I'd go two years sober, and then try again you know i was so yeah. jealous of 
I was just jealous of people that could just drink normally. They could just be social drinkers. Yeah. So I kept trying it over and over again and kept failing. I'd, I'd be okay for a few days, but then I would, you, you know, I'd be right back in the same rut with the same pain, with the same shaking hands and, the, yeah. and you know, the whole deal. So finally in 2008, um, I drank again, but this time I called my wife and I, I was in Utah and, and I told her I drank. It was like the first time I've ever been honest mm. about it. And I go, the difference this time, and I know I've said it before, but I'm really going to go all in and, uh, you know, listen to these guys with 30 years sobriety and stuff and take direction and, and try to, you know, get well and stay there. And that was like 13 years plus ago. But uh, in the meantime, after I was sober about three years, I decided to start reaching out on Facebook, you know, using social media to maybe offer my sober friendship, encouragement, support to anybody that was out there like suffering yeah. and, and, you know, struggling in there in, to get sober. And I was hoping, you know, to use social media to maybe I could, you know, at least share my story, like I'm not promoting rehabs, I'm not promoting 12-step program. Until we get one-on-one, -on -one, I'm gonna tell them how I did it. Yeah. You know, maybe they maybe they can take a couple things from that, because obviously what they're doing isn't working. Yeah. And I've worked with about 130 plus people over the last 10 years, and I've seen a lot of success. So that, you know, when you see somebody just in a really bad spot and they look horrible they've lost their home wife job cars and, and then all of a sudden they turn their lives around it's really neat to look at that and when i worked after working with my first guy and he did well and by the way he has eight plus years sobriety wow. or nine years somewhere around there um it it, it, it was really encouraged me to keep it going you know mm -hmm. I, I'm not a rehab program. All I'm doing is offering my sober friendship. Yep. So uh, I'm not offering her any miracles. You have to want to get sober. So, but um, I have seen a lot of success. And um, but I stated the principles as far as I don't promote anything. And like you were just saying earlier, there's a lot of different ways to do it. Yeah. So I don't say do it this way or you know. This is the best way. I, I never throw that out there. All I do is tell them how I did it. Right. You know, they can they can do it their way or whatever they want. You know. Well, that's so. that's that's exactly the way it is. I was thinking about this earlier. It's um, there's there's no manual that's going to work for everyone. So you know, you see the books, how to become a millionaire, and all this stuff. Okay, there's a guide, <laughs> right? There's there's guides on how they these people got there, but. In each way of getting to that goal, if whatever it is, there's there's a little bit of uh, you know how do you say um, tweaks? There's tweaks here and there. Some people AA it will work, um, but some people partial AA and meditation works. Some people AA doesn't yeah. work. Other things sure. maybe people get into healthy exercise, spirituality. It's, there's a whole sure. myriad of different reasons why individuals find success. It's not just a it's not a cookie cutter kind of thing right i think all those things will work but one thing i think that you should stick with and that is like whether you believe in any kind of higher power or god whatever you believe in i think when you wake up in the morning you should say whoever you know look up to the sky and say please keep me sober one more day you yeah. know and, and then use your whatever it is you know, but I just don't think you, you you don't need to get cocky in your sobriety or, you know, go, think ever think you got this or any kind of stuff. Like, like, for instance, I'll get a newcomer and he'll say things like, I'm done. And, you know, I'll never do that again. You know, he just throws out these like impossible tasks yeah. when all you have to do is just say, Stay sober today. That that's one thing that I've I've held on to for dear life, 
and that is kind of living that one day at a time, you know, and it, it kind of keeps me grounded. And, and because I know if I go back from trying it so many times to drink normal, like the average show that watches the game and can drink four beers and not drink for a month or whatever, yeah, yeah. you know, those people, you know, I know what the results are going to be. And, and so I really do take the one day at a time serious. But I do agree, you can do it through prayer, uh, you know, the meditation, there, there's a lot of different ways. So uh, there's not like one way you have to do it. But I would say, don't get too comfortable. Um, you know, don't take it for granted. Let's just put it that way. Don't take yeah. it for granted. You well, know, appreciate it. I um, see I'm sober now and I've, I mean, I've got so much under my belt, which is good. And I'm seeing things differently, obviously. But my problem is like what you're alluding to complacency. I mean, yeah. what's working for you every day? And like, you know, I mean, I don't want to get into what I'm doing every day. But one of the little things is I write down on a notepad my goals for tomorrow. I don't write a journal. I write in point form. And that's always been helping me. So I'm continuously that's doing good. that. And then at night, I, I've never done this before, Mark. I actually say, and it's just it's subconscious, but it comes consciously. Say thank you, God, for another great day. I really say that. I mean, I'm not embarrassed to say it. I've never That's done. That's amazing. It. And That's so perfect. I, I totally agree with that. And you know, one guy I was working with. Um, told me something and I go that's that's weird I mean I'll do it but it, you know what do you have to tell me that for and he told me to make my bed yeah do that you know every day and I'm like okay you know and what he was basically tell me is get some order in my life yeah. you know, if you get up and you make your bed and you know like you're saying you're setting up a schedule for tomorrow you know, you're, you're getting your life in order, you know, because when you're drinking and stuff, you're, you're not thinking about anything except, you know, what a rut you're in and, and your life is in disarray. Yeah. When you feel like your life's in order, it, it's just, a, it's a great feeling, you know, and to have little goals and stuff like writing down what I'm going to do tomorrow and have a schedule or whatever. That's, yeah. that's just, uh, that's just living the dream. See, so like, right. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm going to write down tonight um, what I'm not allowed to do in Ontario tomorrow. <laughs> but I mean, that's all going to uh, change. That's all going to change slowly. But, um, you know, the bed making thing is so simple, but it's actual and it's like keeping an organized home because we all have to realize that our brains are very, very complex and subconscious parts of our brains are complex. So if you have order just visually, subconsciously, it's going to give you, well, I'm just saying as a lay person, I'm not a neuro, neuro um, surgeon, but I believe your subconscious seeing an organization gives you a way to proceed organized in your day. It eliminates risk of stress too, because yeah. sometimes stress, stress can lead to relapse oh yeah if if you feel like there's all this you know your life's not in order or my best not made you know uh, it, it might be a trigger i i like to identify especially when i'm working with somebody new i like to identify all their triggers you yeah. know because you're you're really it's a very strange place to be in those early months those early couple three months because you're not familiar with it, you know, you're used to being numb by a drug or alcohol. And now all of a sudden, you know, all your feelers are going, you're, you're trying to learn to be comfortable in your own skin sober. And that's not yeah. easy. You know, yeah. um, it wasn't easy for me because I had a lot of fear. Mm -hmm. I, and I, I really had to work through that fear um, and, and it was very difficult. Um, I had exercises. I used to confront people. It was so hard to confront people. Mm -hmm. And, and I just, I practiced it and then I became comfortable. And suddenly I could be around small groups of people and be totally comfortable where that was a spot in the past where I need four beers before I do that. Really? You know what I mean? Or if, if 10 people in my living room and I grab my acoustic guitar, I'm, I'm like having a heart attack already. I'd rather play in front of 30,000 people you know. than 10. Uh, you know, but just things like that. I, I was a, 
I had this fear and it was unexplainable fear. And I worked with somebody who taught me how to how to work through those fears and the things that we're afraid of, I shouldn't have been, but I was. Yeah. And it was just basic little social things. One on one talks with somebody made me nervous, you know, and it's just something that was inside of me that that was a definitely a trigger for me to relapse. So when when and, you when you started drinking, you were probably in your teens. I'm assuming. Have you ever? Uh, well, I, I know I know you have, but I'm just curious. So I'll, I'll just ask, just to, just be confident on my question. So have you gone back and found out why you drank, and um, is there been a resolution or? Yeah, I, I know why I drank. Um, well, first it was just a party and, you know, have fun with my friends. Um, but it, it made everything easier because of my shyness, the embedded fear I would told you about. And it, I, I, would, I just had the mindset, not so much when I was a teenager, but when I got into my 20s and I'm playing in front of people and I'm playing my guitar and stuff that beer was like the cure for everything, <laughs> you know, yeah. nervousness or whatever, have a couple beers and everything's okay. Um, uh, I don't feel so good today. Give me a beer. I feel great now. You know what I mean? It was like, uh, you know, the cure for everything or whatever um, in my mind that that's how how far out I was. But um, I think the most difficult thing in early sobriety is being comfortable in your own skin. Yeah. I, and, and I know it's common that people are not comfortable. That's why they go a week and they go, you know, F it. And, you know, you can think of a thousand reasons why you should be drinking right now. Um, so it's difficult and and i do warn these guys that it's going to be tough but mm -hmm. once you get down the road it's going to get easier your life's going to really get better and, and i finally believe these guys but i remember it being three months in i'll never forget it i i went to a guy that i was working with and i go hey i totally believe that my life is going to get better you you know you, you said about three months it's been three months and it ain't getting better yet, but <laughs> I still believe you, man. I still believe you. But sure enough, some time started to roll by. Things started going my way. My life started to change. Good things were happening. Um, it, was un it was unbelievable. And the more I got of that, the more I wanted to stay where I was. You know, I didn't want to go back and have everything go dark again. You know, I want to keep moving to the light, you know. And, uh, so my life's good today. Uh, it, it's good today sober. Uh, and the other thing is, it, as corny as it sounds, but I like waking up every day feeling similar, you know. Not like, oh, I'm even more pain than yesterday or, you know what I mean? Or I who do I have feel. to apologize to or what did I do last night? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I yeah. see. Uh, I see you're a grandfather, and you're. I see you're so happy with that. I mean, that's amazing. Yeah. I just became a grandfather. I never used to like the term. I thought, you know, call me. I know. Call me chum, but now I love it. <laughs> yeah. I was interviewing um, Mike Reno the other day, and I was showing him baby pictures. <laughs> oh, sweet. Yeah. Yeah, I. That's what I noticed. Guys like Mike Reno, you know. We're, we're peers, and, and yeah. we, when we were in our heyday, you know, we had the, ad, we were in like this mega competition, you know, mm. it's like you play with another band, you want to, you want to kill them. You want they, them they to suck. They totally, yeah. they, they totally suck. Yeah. And, you know, we're going to blow these guys off the stage. Yeah. Now we're backstage, high five in it, how's the kid? Yeah. Who's your rehab guy? You should talk to my guy, you know. It, it's like the conversations have changed. People are more humble. Uh, you know, we appreciate each other and, and that we're still here and we're playing better than ever, you know. Mm -hmm. So when I play with guys like Mike Reno or get to meet those guys, in fact, we, we played with them in Europe uh, a couple of years ago. 
but uh you know they they sounded as good as they ever did mm -hmm. um you know the whole band was cool as cool as crap yeah and uh yeah it's fun it's fun to meet these guys Plus, we uh, never played with them. We never played with them in our all those day. years. So I'm like playing with REO Speedwagon. We just played with Sticks a couple yeah. times. You know, we're playing with bands that we didn't tour with. You know, um, it, it just didn't happen to run into them. I, I think they did come out a couple of years before us, but um, somehow we never ran into them. So it's it's fun to run into guys you know you know about, but you've never mad or played with or whatever you know holy geez were you doing prep work on me before the interview mark because that was that was a great segue because lover boy stick scenario are on a major tour and, and starting at the end of may yeah i had no idea <laughs> sure you did. I had no, you, but you, all those guys i swear to god uh, because it. reo we played with about three years ago and then sticks was just a few months back played two shows and um I'd never spoken with any of these guys. You know, I talked to Kevin Cronin for like 40 minutes. I mean, guy's just totally down to earth. Greatest guy ever. And, uh, you know, Tommy Shaw, we hung out with him a lot. I used to play one of his guitars, uh, this duotone. Oh, yeah. Acoustic side, electric side. And uh, so I talked about that. Plus, I he didn't know it, but you talked about can't get there from here. Well, Jack played, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah. Jack played produced that album, and yes, and I play I played one of Tommy's guitars that was just sitting around. And what, oh, what song? You know, when Jack said I could play it, I didn't end up using it. Oh, the action, everything, but I I, I played it, but mm. ended up not using it on the track because okay. it, it it was set up for him and wasn't yeah. uh, quite what the way I the way I play yeah. it wasn't set up for me. But um, I, I just, you know, I was just sharing, shooting the shit with them. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but yeah, uh, that was a fun record to make. Uh, you know, with Jack Blades, he, he's just a genius. He, he's like, a, he's like an older teenager. You know, he has that energy where yeah. he jumps all over the room and just wigs out all the time. Yeah, yeah. that's pretty amazing i i was fortunate enough to meet him when night ranger played uh harris michigan island resort and casino and i went backstage and saw them and yeah he is just such a great guy uh speaking great of guy. get there from here what's your favorite track off of that one if you if you had to name one um gosh uh the couple that um one that i really like sonically because of the uh the tones of the acoustics and and clean oh. guitar si silent night yes uh, that it, it's just a the the guitar tones and the orchestration in the tune are pretty cool and then uh, as far as the rockers um, I like freedom song oh freedom song's cool yeah, yeah. Free freedom song um, What's the kind of rocker we had on that? Um, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum, oh yeah, the ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum song. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Okay, I can't remember all our songs. I know like you four hundred songs. I know thirteen studio albums, about four hundred songs. I mean, you know, I, hear I can't you. remember everything, but uh, I hear you. That, so, there was a couple good ones on there. So. Um, so what would you say to um, the viewers out here that are looking for some direction? I know that you're not going to say you have to do this, but what word of encouragement would you say to the viewers that are struggling with, um, you know, addiction and with alcohol in particular? Yeah. Um, I would just say, you know, I, I really believe anybody can get sober. Um, you know, you, you have to... The way I've done it is I had to commit to it in my head before I actually went and did it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, um, I thought about it for a couple of years before I did it, but to actually make the plunge, you, you have to be fully committed and, and really want it, you know? And, and I would say, it, you know, talk to people that have a lot of time because... You know, so you kind of know what to expect and 
uh, you know, no matter what route you choose, you know, I think that fellowship's important. Yep. I think that, you know, even if you're not into AA and you want to pray to your furniture or whatever, whatever <laughs> way you want to do it um, is fine. But one thing I think that Bill W. guy got right yeah. is, is to talk to people that have your same problem. Well, because yeah. it, it makes you not feel so alone. Like, yeah, God, I, I'm the only guy in the world that has this, you know, yeah. you talk to other people and you hear them share their stories and they tell your story every time. That's and and it, it's like, you feel like, man, this is a group of people that are just like me. Yeah. You know, how cool is that? You know, so, you know, to talk to people that have sobriety and that have had success, I, I would say, you know, just talk to them. And, and, and uh, you know, in the early going, just be forewarned, it's not going to be easy. But, yeah. you know, just stay committed. And, and I promise that your life is going to get better. Yeah. I, I, I just know it. I mean, I'm not just throwing that out there. I know it. It's yeah. going to get better. No, I believe you. I've I've heard that, and then you know, I mean, I would go so long, and then I would have uh, a relapse so long. It was a pattern for friggin' thirty years, but now I've been the sober longest I've been in thirty-five years, and I won't say the amount. I don't want to, you know, but it's it's irrelevant. But anyways, um, yeah, I mean, I appreciate your uh, talking to me, and I'm, I'm sure you're going to um, um, get get through to some people. For sure, that are watching, and uh, yeah, I appreciate it. Um, that's it. that's what it, that's that's my goal. Um, and where's you know, that page? Uh, Where can people uh, find on Facebook that page? What's um, it called? Just Mark Mark Kindle. Uh, I'm on Instagram, Twitter. You know, um, I constantly make a post. I'm not I'm not hiding from anyone. I'm not you know the big bitch and rock star that hides from people. No. You can get a hold of me. You can send me messages on Facebook. Yep. If you're looking to get sober, uh, like I said, I'll share my story. You don't have to do anything I did, but I, I'm happy to share my story and give my time to anybody, and I mean anybody that wants to get sober, that's that's having a rough time, because it, it's. Uh, it's, it's an easier life. I can, I can tell you that right now. Yes. Yeah. It's a way easier life. Yeah. Being a using alcoholic addict or whatever is so much work. Yeah. It, it about melts your brain. Yeah. It, it, it's so tough because you're chasing normal. I call it chasing normal because I just don't want to feel bad. It's not like I want to be completely out of my mind by noon every day. Yeah. I just don't want to feel bad. So, you know, you need to get the mixture and all this stuff to where if you're just normal all the time, you're never chasing nothing. Yeah, you, know, yeah, you, yeah. Can, you can ch channel your energy to things that are more positive yeah. and use your time time more effectively, you know, or yeah. things that matter, <laughs> you know, so. So before I let you go, a couple quick things. I forgot to say, to ask... Uh, Ask everybody to subscribe to the channel. It doesn't cost you anything. I had somebody thinking it was costing. So subscribe to the channel and you'll get some unique interviews with a bit of a comedy thrown in. Thrown in. Not usually for me because I'm not funny, but maybe my guests will say something funny. <laughs> but Mark, if you can uh, point over to your left, like, like this, point with yeah. your uh, right hand to your left, up a bit, uh, back, and then just point down with your finger like this uh you're right right there right right there hit that subscribe button please thanks mark i appreciate it um <laughs> i've got uh, coming up i've got an interview with biff naked coming up and before i let mark go i'm going to show you some skin okay <laughs> can you see that let me know if you can see that dude right on does it look familiar yeah, it looks like a shark on your uh arm there well, what Playing shark? Is... Yeah, it looks like an old uh, great white situation. It is. It's it from, cool. from, from Let It Rock, the album sleeve. I loved it, so I had to get it. That's a, You know what? I'm not sure if you can see the color, but that's about 30 years old. That ink stayed so good. It looks pretty good. 
Thanks, I man. actually I got one when I was in Amsterdam. I never went in for the full sleeve vibe and all that, but yeah. um, actually I was drinking that day. <laughs> yeah. And I went and got a tattoo. In Amsterdam, you were drinking? Yeah. No. Yeah, yeah, you know. Actually, but, uh, oh, I didn't mean to interject. Actually, I didn't want to. Um, Amsterdam, did you hear the latest on it? Um, you know how there's the woke moment and everything yeah. is woke? There is a petition oh, well, going yeah. around town to change the name from Amsterdam to Amsterdam. Because, <laughs> because they yeah, thought it was yeah, offensive. Yeah. <laughs> Just well, check this out. Check this out. I got a face. I got a Facebook warning for making a quote out of the movie Three Amigos. Uh, they warned me, uh, and what what the quote was was, "I'll fill you so full of lead, you'll be using your dick for a pencil." <laughs> and Steve Martin said that, right? Yeah, yeah. And and I was just reposting it because it was a funny quote, and it was in the movie Three Amigos. Yeah. I got all these warning, warning. Uh, I know you made a mistake; it was an accident, but that's not our standards. <laughs> like, yeah. Like, yeah. Oh man. Yeah. Like, it wasn't. They weren't even my words. It was a quote from a movie, a comedy like, movie. Like Facebook has standards these days, right? No, standard. It's oh. a standard. I thought that was funny. That Anyways, was. All right. Well, thank you, Ernest. Man, yes. thanks for having me on the show, brother. Hey, no problem. Uh, maybe in a, you know, a set amount of time, uh, we'll touch base again, and I'll uh, let you know uh, my progress, and uh, we'll catch up. Maybe you guys are putting out an album or something, and uh, if uh, Canada ever opens up here. If you look on the United Nations list of countries, we're the most recent communist one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i know the the border's really tough but i yeah. kind of actually like that but uh yeah hopefully things get better you know with the whole pandemic thing and all that and yeah you know, start to open up and people can start enjoying themselves again yeah it's been two years for sure anyways thanks uh thank you to bridget for uh helping out with the uh, video part of this interview uh, and uh yeah. thank melissa for setting it up and uh i'll keep in touch with you on uh on uh facebook mark Thanks, Ernest.